All right. Super fun to see the coalition of the willing starting to uh, come together. Uh, Candy and Carl, glad to see you were able to make it. I've, I've pre uh, preloaded your question about the chapter number. So uh, Paul is uh, Paul's got an answer for that. Um, Ed, good to see you from uh, from North Carolina today. And and uh, I see Stacy from uh, from Carmel by the Sea, or at least I'm going to say Carmel by the Sea. And I see the mayor of Great Falls. You'll always be my mayor, Randy. Uh, and Missouri is always uh, well represented when Janet's around. Uh, Carolyn from Helena, uh, really super to see so many um, so many familiar faces and some new ones for what I know is going to be a really fun hour together tonight um, uh, as we uh, as we talk books for the first time in 2021. Um, this book club was kind of one of my lame brain ideas when we were all sheltering in place in uh, April or May of last year. And it's really been terrific to see so many people uh, get engaged and to see the willingness of, of you know, famous authors like Paul Bogard, who are willing to, with a, a phone call and an email, say, sure, I'm, I'm in. I'd be happy to hang out with you guys uh, and talk about dark skies and astronomy and, and parks and special places. Um, so it, it really has been great. Welcome to 2021. Um, I scheduled this tonight because it's we're right in the beginning of a new moon. So if you are inspired by tonight's discussion and you uh, don't have a lot of clouds like we are currently having here in Montana, uh, you can go outside and, and see um, among the darkest skies of the month uh, here at this time of the month. I'm Doug Mitchell. I have the great privilege of being the executive director of the Glacier National Park Conservancy. And um, we are really delighted to have with us uh, tonight, Paul Bogard, who is joining us from uh, his in-laws house, actually, in the suburbs out uh, in the uh, Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, where Paul uh, teaches at Hamlin uh, University. Uh, and he has published two books, including uh, The End of Night. He already pub also published The Ground Beneath Us. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later. He's just had a kid's book come out, which I'm pretty excited um, uh, to share with you guys as well uh, tonight. So, uh, Paul, thanks for joining us. That's great to be here, Doug. Thank you. It's really wonderful to see everybody here tonight. We um, we talked a little bit. Um, you you haven't been to Glacier in a while. Um, in fact, I think it's pre driver's license, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a long, long time. We um, we uh, my parents and sister and I uh, hopped on the train here in the Twin Cities and took the train up. Um, but it's been uh, I hesitate to say, but it's probably been 40 years since I was there. Um, I remember, I was telling the folks before, I remember uh, mountain goats and mountains. Uh, it's about the extent of my memory of Glacier. Well, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get you back out um, uh, for sure. And and one of the great things, obviously, about the park and our work, our, our mission is to preserve Glacier Park for future generations. So I can honestly say not much has changed, Paul. Uh, in 40 years, and and um, the dark skies are are going to be on on the scale, um, pr pretty much where they where they were back then. And um, we really hope you'll come out and, and join us. And um, your journey in this book um, to places around the world really um, really is really interesting to follow. And I think that's the you call this book a little bit a memoir. Um, it's a it's memoir, travel log, science book. Kind of how, how do you classify it when you talk to people about it? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I always make the point that I wanted to write a book of stories. So um, it's, you know, the story of my uh, journey to these different places, um, my journey to kind of understand the issue. Um, some of it is uh, stories from my, you know, my past a little bit. Um, and then a lot of stories about, uh, uh, the people that I meet and the work that they do and uh, stories from the past. Um, we were talking earlier, a little earlier about, uh, you know, some of the really fascinating research um, that I discovered is the writing um, uh, by folks who in the, when artificial light was just coming to Western Europe, they were starting to just sort of exult in the idea that you could go out and walk around at night. Um, just something brand new that you know that we obviously completely take for granted now. Um, so it was really fun to go on that journey too, a journey in, in history. Um, 
that's how I describe it. Some people are, <clears throat> I think some people think it's a, it's a book about astronomy and there is astronomy in it, but I'm an English professor uh, and I, I like stories. So that's what I wanted to have my book be. Right, it's interesting that you mentioned that because one of the er, one of the first books we had was a book that is also in our bookstores, and we've had your your uh, book in our store for a long time. As we have a book called Wolverine Way uh, by Doug Chadwick, and similarly, he's not a biologist; he's a writer, um, but he gives voice to a really important issue, as you do in uh, in this book. So I, I'm looking forward to tonight to talking not only about dark skies themselves and the values they bring to us as a culture, but also what in our own communities we might be able to do to think about this differently. Uh, were you surprised, I certainly was, when you started to talk about and, and research the safety issue of lighting in communities, did that surprise you? Surprised me in, in what way? I mean, it's it's a really important issue, so I'm glad that you raised the question. But how, yeah, it surprised you. I look, more is better would be, would have been if you had asked me if you want a community to be safer, should it be more light or less light? And I would have said more and not thought second of it. You've made me think differently. Yeah, I think it. You know, that is the message that we that we all get um, is that you know because some light can help us be safer and more secure, then more light must make us even more safe and secure and just kind of add infinitum, right? Just kind of more light, more light, more light. Um, and, uh, you know, when you start thinking about it and, and looking at it and talking to people who spend their days working on this issue, um, pretty quickly realize that that, that, that sort of uh, black and white, uh, um, uh, understanding of the issue falls apart. I remember, uh, I, I think I tell the story in the book of being in London and I went over to one of the, the boroughs in London where they, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a plenty of crime there. And I talked to the guy who was in charge of lighting and there was a, a lamp that was kind of hanging over the table that we were talking about. And he kind of reached up and brought it down between us. And he said, you know, we could, if we make this, this light bright enough, I won't be able to see you and you're sitting across the table from me. So this notion that, you know, more light, ever increasing amounts of light make us ever safer, it just at some point too much light makes it hard to see. Um, and I think the one thing that, one of the things that really stays with me about it is the idea that um, because we think that more light makes us safer, um, we think that brightly lit areas, um, they give us the illusion of safety. And we think that, oh, we can let our, we can let our guard down. Um, and, and that uh, is, a, is a problematic issue too. But the bottom line with, with light and darkness and safety and, and danger and that kind of stuff is that it's a really complex issue um, that so often just gets reduced to uh, dark is bad and light is good and more light is better kind of thing. And, and I, clearly it's an issue that's becoming more of a topic in communities um, around, around the country. Are, since you've written the book, um, have you been able to talk to people about what they can do in their own communities to, to talk about this issue? Oh, sure. I mean, the, the light pollution issue in general? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Yeah, it's always a question that comes up. And I think that, you know, on one uh, end of things, I'm always uh, honestly will say that, um, you know, light pollution is one problem that is uh, readily within our abilities to solve. It's, it's not like, um, you know, toxic pollution or uh, climate change or, um, you know, plastics in the ocean, these, these problems that are serious and that we want to deal with, but just seem so big. Um, light pollution at, at some level, if you turn the light off, the problem goes away. Um, if you shield the light, the problem gets cut in half. Um, if, you, if you don't put a light in, you don't create the problem. All these, you know, now, obviously it's a, it's a complex issue and, and there's lots of reasons why um, people like light and have light. And uh, I'm not saying that it's easy, but there are things that, um, we can do to, to solve this problem from the individual level up to the community and state and even national level. Um, 
to, to take action on this issue. So for me, I've always liked that because I feel like um, I feel some agency about uh, making, a, making a good change. We're, we're already seeing some action in the, <clears throat> pardon me, in the chat uh, to, to get back to that topic about co community outreach and community change. Um, and, and again, we want to encourage folks, if you have questions, feel free to just shout them out. We're a very casual group around here. Also, um, just use the chat. Um, I may also, we've sent out a discussion guide. I may refer to that and ask um, folks um, to their views on, on things here and there. But um, before we kind of launch in, into that, I've asked Paul if, if he might choose a selection out of the book and share with us to, to kick us off. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, and I want to uh, read from uh, a short section, just a couple paragraphs from um, an experience that I had. It was actually uh, before I started writing the book, um, but it fit in well with uh, with the um, with the book once I was working on it. Um, so I'll just read this to you. The most beautiful starry night I've ever seen was more than 20 years ago when I was backpacking through Europe as an 18 year old high school graduate. I had traveled south from Spain into Morocco and from there south to the Atlas Mountains at the edge of the Sahara Desert to a place that when I look on a map, I can no longer find where nomadic tribes came in from the desert to barter and trade. One night in a youth hostel that was more like a stable, I woke and walked out into a snowstorm. But it wasn't the snow I was used to in Minnesota or anywhere else I'd been. Standing bare chest to cool nights, wearing flip-flops and shorts, I let a storm of stars swirl around me. I remember no light pollution. I remember no lights. But I remember the light around me the sense of being lit by starlight and that I could see the ground to which the stars seemed to be floating down. I saw the sky that night in three dimensions. The sky had depth, some stars seemingly close, some much farther away. The Milky Way so well defined it had what astronomers call structure, that sense of its twisting depths. I remember stars from one horizon to the other, Stars stranger in their numbers than the wooden cart full of severed goat heads I'd seen that morning, <laughs> making a night sky so plush, it still seems like a dream. So much was right about that night. It was a time of my life when I was every day experiencing something new. I felt open to everything as though I were made of clay and the world was imprinting upon me its breathtaking beauty. Standing nearly naked under that Moroccan sky, skin against the air, the dark, the stars. The night pressed its impression and my lifelong connection was sealed. Wow, um, thank you for sharing that and for the whole book. It's, it's so beautifully written. Um, and, and I think especially it's a great piece that you've chosen in the context of what we're all going through, right? Over this past year, I've said a lot recently and I've felt that we've been reminded very vividly of the power of special moments and special places, the restorative power of those places, places like the dark, like Glacier Park, to restore us in times of need and, and to in times of celebration as well. So um, thank you for, for sharing that. That's really, um, it's some beautiful writing for sure. And uh, those who haven't read your book um, are, I'm hoping getting on our website and buying it. It's in stock and ready to go. Um, it's a real treasure. Um, I promised one um, one question for Carl and Candy, um, which is the odd chapter numbering. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, th thank you for the question. Um, there's actually a, a fairly simple um, explanation. It's the uh, Bortle scale. Um, the Bortle scale is a, a essentially a scale of darkness levels um, that starts with uh, nine our brightest places and works its way down to one, our darkest places. And so um, I thought it would be neat to, to uh, in the book, start with some of our brightest places. So I begin with uh, Times Square in Las Vegas. Um, 
and then I work my way kind of down to our darkest places. So that's why the the book starts with chapter nine and works its way down to chapter one. That's great. That's super creative. I love that. That's a neat. Uh, that's a neat thing. And um, and. I, I was unaware of the Bortle scale. I learned so much in the book. I learned some terminology about good light and, and things. And, and uh, it really is, um, it really is a, a great read. Um, so Jill, I know we've already got some questions. If you wanted to curate some of those perhaps. Yeah, sure. Let's dive right in. Um, speaking of that scale, uh, Bonnie actually had a question about Glacier and she was wondering um, where Glacier falls on that scale. Um, or falls in terms of light pollution, if anyone yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody might know. I haven't, that's a good question. You can, um, you can look online uh, at, uh, I think it's Dark Sky Finder is the, if you Google that, maybe the, um, the uh, World Atlas of the Artificial Night Sky Brightness, which is essentially the, the Atlas of Light uh, Pollution. Yeah. Is, is that right? Cool. It looks like it's a it's dark sight finder. I'll go ahead and pop it in the chat Perfect. here so everyone can reference it. Cool. Yeah. So that might, that'll give everybody a good idea, not only of you know glacier or wherever you are. Um, and you know, my guess is um, so. There's as I say in the book, there are uh, almost no Bortle scale one sites left in the lower 48. Um, people debate that. Um, um, the the guy that I was out with a couple nights from the park service said over he'd given 200 classifications and only three places he'd given a Bortle scale one in the park service uh, area. My guess is Glacier is probably in the in the two range though, um, two or maybe three. It really depends on. Someone posted in the chat what it is. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask John Harrington, who I see is on. Okay. John, you may know the answer to this question off the top of your head, don't you? Hi, Doug. Yeah, roughly speaking, of course, it depends on where in the park you are. On the west side, uh, you're probably closer to Bortle 2 around Apgar. There, there's a little bit of electric signage over there. On the east side, uh, it's probably getting closer to 1, 1.5. Yeah. A little tiny bit of light from St. Mary, but that's it. It's pretty dark. Pretty dark in the whole park but especially on the east side and of course pitch dark uh up up at logan uh we we could not do what we do in the park without john harrington um and a lot of his uh uh nighttime uh, friends and colleagues who uh have helped us out for many many years with with all of our programming so thank you john for uh for all of that it means a lot um means a lot to us yeah happy to happy to help doug Thanks, John. Yeah, I see John also kind of chimed in. Um, we had a, a bit of a chat back and forth and Paul, feel free to weigh in here too um, about international dark sky parks. Um, uh, Death Valley was brought up in the chat, Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve. And then this is where John jumped in and mentioned there's over 40 international dark sky parks in the US. Um, and a mixture of those are national and state parks, Glacier Waterton being one of them. Um, do you want to touch on those or do you have any favorites that you want to reflect on? Well, it's interesting when I wrote the book, which is, um, so I was doing, I started doing the research. I, I was just thinking about my glory days about 10 years ago, I was in Paris doing the research for this, for this book. And, uh, and so, and then for the next year or so on the road, um, there weren't as many official dark sky parks even back then. There's been a real, they've made a real effort within the last, you know, three, four, five years to really expand that program, um, which I think is great. Um, so um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would, I would necessarily have a favorite, but I really, I obviously support the movement and the, the IDA folks, the Dark Sky Association have been really, um, I count them as as friends and I do a lot of stuff with them and they've been, you know, the work they do is um, um, it's, it's kind of funny. Sometimes people think, oh, the Dark Sky Association, there must be a hundred people there, you know, and they, they say, you know, we have five people in the office doing this for the whole planet. So yeah, they're dedicated. <clears throat> yeah, really great work. Well, thanks for touching on that. Um, 
Susan mentioned she found the Luxar light and its effect on insects and birds really amazing. So she's wondering how can we help reduce or get rid of it? The Luxar light? Yes. <laughs> oh gosh, I mean, um, I don't know, um, it's, you know, honestly. Um, uh, it, you know, it's funny. I went to Las Vegas because um, as some people think of it as kind of the, the, uh, the epitome of light pollution. And I love telling the story of meeting, discovering that there was such thing as a Las Vegas Astronomical Society. And that yes, they would meet me down on the strip with uh, a bunch of telescopes and we could go stargazing, you know. Um, it just seemed like it was too good to be true. But I think that for me at least, um, things like the Luxor and Las Vegas in general are, they're, they're terrible when it comes to light pollution, but um, we shouldn't kind of take our eye off the ball and forget that the stuff that we see in a place like that is just a exaggerated version of what we see everywhere. So the light, you know, um, yes, the, the Luxor beam is, is awful and it attracts um, birds and bats and insects from around, you know, from around the the surrounding desert and all that, but there are, you know, every city has the same kind of problem in a similar way. Um, and and uh, that's really what I want us to pay attention to. Yeah, cool. Um, Leah mentioned on page 232, if anyone's following along in the book, you quote Roger, is it Narboni, Narboni? Narboni, yeah. Roger Narboni. Um, who says he'd like a program about light and darkness in schools since quote, kids don't learn anything about light, end quote. So mm -hmm. Leah's wondering what might such a curriculum, cur curriculum excuse me, look like um, and how might it look if you were teaching such a curriculum say in a city during the day? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so Roger Narboni is a really interesting guy that I think people would enjoy um, learning about. He um, is a lighting designer and he was kind of spearheaded the relighting of Paris a few years ago. They gave him the task of, um, of reducing the, uh, I think the energy, either, either the carbon emissions or the energy output or whatever of the city by 30% um, while maintaining everything that people love about Paris, right? All the, the city of light. Um, <laughs> But he's a super interesting guy for a lot of reasons, one of which is he's from North Africa. And he talked about how when he grew up, um, you know, if you go outside, it's super bright. And so they would stay inside, they would stay in the shade. And he really, that's where he first started really um, uh, becoming appreciative of the darkness, of the shade. And so I think that, um, you know, teaching kids about it, um, certainly stories, um, talking about personal experiences like Narboni's experience growing up. Um, you know, what are the things that asking the kids what their experiences have been? Um, uh, reading stories from different cultures. That was one of the, um, Doug asked me about, you know, was I surprised by the safety and security issue? I was pleasantly surprised to find stories in other cultures where darkness isn't. Um, uh, thought of the way that it is in our culture too often where darkness is appreciated. Um, and I think though that at some level it would be hard to run a really effective class without some field trips um, at night. And uh, there's nothing like having kids look through a telescope and seeing the rings of Saturn or the surface of the moon um, or going out at night and looking at the stars. That just would have to be, I can't imagine a class without that. Sure. Yeah, it's really it's a really interesting question, Leah. And, and um, one of the things we've been trying to noodle out as we have this large new telescope over at St. Mary um, in the Dusty Star Observatory that can be run remotely and that can also be programmed to get certain images of deep space um, is the idea of, for example, in a classroom, maybe you would study the Barbell Nebula and then you would make a request of Glacier Park to have the Barbell Nebula get photographed by the telescope 
so that then it can be unveiled in your class. Now we could do that live if the classroom was in India, right? But when it's in, it's in Chicago, it's a little more difficult, but um, the idea of distance learning, both in general, to bring people to the park who couldn't be there, and then specifically to the telescope is really something we're trying to dig into. It's part of our grant application actually for next year as well, to think through and invest in these kinds of things. So. Um, for those who are interested in investing in those, we're, we're raising money for exactly those kind of um, things um, right now um, in the park for the Dark Skies uh, programming in, in the park overall. So it's a great question. And we'd also love some ideas. We don't have all the answers, but if there's a way we could engage in that, um, we'd love to, to hear more about that. It's a great question. Jill, I just wanted to say I'm, it's hard for me to keep up with the... Uh, chat questions and like uh, listen to the questions <laughs> too. So I appreciate you asking them. There was one that I wanted to though, um, uh, Nora Gray mentioned chapter two um, about Francois Juice uh, and the, uh, the project in Paris. And I just wanted to echo, pick up on that because like Narboni, um, Francois Juice was this, I mean, you know, like I was saying, 10 years ago, I was standing in front of Notre Dame, we had agreed, he'd agreed to meet me there. And I'm standing there thinking like, who is this guy? You know, well, how will I know if it's him? And he comes, I, I kid you not, but it was like walking out of the mists, you know, the smoke and mist <laughs> toward me. And he's got like a flannel shirt on and he's smoking a cigar and a, he looks kind of like a French lumberjack. And uh, it was it was one of the most fun nights I had. And I think I, you know, I, I speak French enough to get the, the gist of it, but um, not, I am sure I missed it a ton too, but it was so much fun. And I just love, one thing I love about Juice was that he had, he's, he had a uh, parking permit that allowed him to park anywhere in Paris mm -hmm. so that he could work on the lights. So if he was driving somewhere, you know, he could pull into the Notre Dame, plaza or anywhere and just stop because he had to check out the lights which I, I kind of love that that part of it so <laughs> yeah thanks for noticing that and commenting on that that's really cool um just looking down the list here um carrie with us is a fellow twin cities resident uh, she's wondering if there's any local organizations that you know of or could reflect on that are working on dark sky initiatives. Yeah, I should know. I should have a really good answer for that. Um, my excuse is that I've been uh, working in Virginia for the last <laughs> eight years. So I, I am a little out of the loop with the Twin Cities. Um, I'm not sure if there's a dark sky association group here or not. If there isn't, there should be. Um, uh, I felt um, a uh, little frustrated to come back just after the new street lights were put in and to not have had a bigger, at least tried to have a bigger say in the street lights that were chosen, which to my mind are okay, but not not great. Um, if it, I would say to everybody, if, if your community hasn't moved to LED lighting, you, it probably is coming. And now is the time to get in and say, we demand that we have uh, a certain kind of LEDs. Um, we could talk more about that, um, and not the blue, rich, white, super bright um, ones that they were putting in a lot of cities a few years ago. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer to my fellow Twin City, and but um, you can contact me <laughs> individually, and maybe we can get something started. Awesome. So Paul, I wanted to ask you know uh, about kind of your as a writer, right? You know, so so you're a writer. Um, and you teach writing, you teach English anyway. Um, so you teach the, 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 um, the, the our art of write, writing, of, of literature. Um, tell us a little about your writing process. How did you, how did you write the book? How did you, you wanted to write a book, you came to the subject. How do, how do you do that? Are you a pen and paper guy? Did you, do you um, write it in chapters? Do you write a page a day? What's your process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I, I, I use a typewriter, or typewriter, what, what the heck is that? I use a computer. <laughs> um, 
uh, right with the keyboard. Uh, that's an easy, an easy answer there. Um, I do a lot of research, so I'm always reading, uh, taking notes, gathering um, articles about different things that I can draw on. Um, I remember with uh, going back to the question about the, the nine chapters, I remember when um, uh, at one point in my my room, I had uh, nine stacks of papers because I had printed out all these articles for each chapter. So each chapter, I had a stack of, of, of pieces that I wanted to draw upon. Um, uh, I, I definitely rely on um, field work, which is, you know, going out and meeting people like with Roger Narboni or Francois Jus in Paris or all the other stories um, and taking notes while I'm there. Um, lots of interviews um, uh, used to be some by phone and, and now is, uh, you know, uh, Zoom and, and, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and then the actual writing process itself is, um, uh, it's hard work. It's really hard work. It's, um, uh, I'm a really slow writer. It takes me a lot of time. And uh, um, I'm just actually finishing, I'm doing a, a coffee table book of night sky photography with a, a great um, photographer named Bo Rogers, uh, which will be out next next year, about a year from now. And I've done the writing for it. I'm just finishing up and I'm in the, uh, just, to, just to tell everybody kind of the kind of thing that writer, neurotic uh, kind of things that writers do today. I was just, I highlighted the word of throughout the entire um, manuscript and I was going through to see if I could get rid of that preposition, you know, in as many places as I could. So that's the kind of, you know, you get to that line editing point. Um, uh, it's, it, it's good work though. And it, it, it's something that obviously I, I really believe in. And um, The End of Night, the book that we're talking about tonight has been um, a tremendous, it changed my life. Um, and it's been a tremendous gift to me uh, in terms of not only the travel and, and kind of things I got to do to write the book, but ever since the book came out, getting to talk about it and meet so many people, um, it's been amazing. And, and um, I just hope that I'm doing some good, especially for, um, you know, all the, all our fellow creatures who, uh, you know, don't have a voice in a lot of places and uh, are so impacted by our overuse and misuse of light. Um, that feels good to be able to do something, to use my writing to do something like that. That's really cool. And, and speaking of field research, you have a two-year-old, so it came naturally then to publish your first children's book this year. Oh, that's right. What a great segue, Doug. Um, this is this is uh, called What If Night. This is the, the kid's book that just came out, and um, uh, it is available on Amazon or through the publisher. The, the idea is... Um, the question, what if night never came? Um, and I, the book basically starts off with, it's a little a little kid and her dog. I think there's a little glare, sorry. Um, little kid and her dog, and it starts off with the idea that, wow, that'd be great, we could just play all the time. But then you start to learn about all the neat things about nighttime and, and how uh, it's actually pretty neat that nighttime comes. So that's what the, the kid's book is is all about. Well, that's cool because really, you know, training up the next set of, uh, of public land stewards and dark sky stewards cannot start a minute too early. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. That's right. Well, Jill, I, I see their their questions are continuing to come in. The other place to use the chat or to email Emily, Paul has been gracious enough to agree to uh, sign book plates for anybody who would like a, a book plate inscribed. Um, we'll take care of that for you. You can just put that in the chat. And we'll get the plates and the names and things out to Paul and he will sign those and we'll get them back to you. Thank you for your generosity and spending some time uh, uh, doing that. And, um, and uh, so Jill, I'll hand it back over to you for, because I know there's some other really cool questions in the queue. Thanks, yeah. Thanks hey, everyone. Jill? Jill? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Nora. Mandy's got a question. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, of course. Paul and Doug, just three uh, quick comments. <clears throat> One is, as a former mayor of Great Falls, Montana, a place to have input on uh, lighting is through the uh, uniform uh, building code. Mm -hmm. That governs what, where lights are directed, how intense they can be, 
And so there is public policy input through the Uniform Building Code around the country, around the world, actually, on adopting those kinds of procedures that might direct light downward rather than up and that sort of thing. Uh, the other comment I had is not just Glacier Park in Montana, this is a dark sky area. The Bob Marshall Wilderness right south of there is actually larger than Glacier in terms of no lights in there whatsoever. And further out of the Ch uh, Charles Russell, uh, Charlie Russell Wildlife Refuge, the American Prairie Reserve Project out in uh, North Central Montana, some 5 million acres bigger than the Bob Marshall and Glacier put together. And there's some terrific dark sky aspect out there. And finally, I just wanted to comment the historical juxtaposition of <clears throat> having these wonderful dark sky areas in Montana compared to our history. And it's Montana's history that really uh, electrified America because the copper that was mined in Butte, <laughs> that was smelted in Anaconda and was refined and turned into wire in Great Falls, that is literally what electrified America. So. We are a blessing and we're a curse all in one package. <laughs> Great Falls good. is not the electric city for no reason, right, Randy? Bingo. <laughs> By funny. the way, everyone in favor of mooning Doug, raise their right hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the respect I'm earning. <laughs> uh. Thanks for your comments, Randy. That was really interesting and yeah, some good insight into Montana history. So really cool. Um, I was just looking at the chat, but I noticed Carolyn, you had your hand raised. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just had a, a quick question. Uh, Paul loved the book. It was a gorgeous book and also, uh, you know, extremely, it got my brain really pumping about what's going on and now the next door chat in the app about light shields in our neighborhood really makes sense to me. So uh, it's a feisty debate in Helena, Montana. But Doug, question for you. Will you have Paul's children's book in the Glacier store? There's a lot of COVID babies in my life. Yes, we, um, um, we, we, uh, yes, I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to apologize for that. Yes to Julie Doherty at uh, our park stores later, but we'll make that happen, Carolyn. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Carolyn. Thanks. Um, Paul, earlier you had a really great resource for everyone, Dark Sight Finder. Do you know of any other resources? And if anyone else wants to chime in too, um, are there resources to be able to track the Northern Lights? Or do you have any advice on seeing the Northern Lights? Because um, Carl in the chat was wondering, if we're able to see them here in Montana, which we are, but I know that the conditions need to be um, kind of like in the right area in order to see them. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't I don't know of us specifically for the Northern Lights, I don't. The Northern, um, hi, this is Colleen in Missoula. The Northern Lights. Oh, sorry, Colleen, I think you just got- Am muted. I muted? Here we, right, go. Except, there we go. There we go. We're in the western part of the state, and I believe in the eastern part of the state also, we're visible um, towards the end of December. Um, and we did see them when we drove outside of Missoula, and not as good as probably you could see them from the prairie side with all the mountains in the way, but it was gorgeous. Um, blues and greens, and it was beautiful. I also want to say that Missoula has become one of the places where light pollution um, is being addressed. And we have installed some street lights. I think they're still terrible. They have so much glare out the sides, but um, it's interesting that our university town that has had so many problems in the last little bit um, is now initiating the light pollution stuff. And it's, it's most interesting. Um, Montana Power is kind of connected into it. Um, or I guess it's called Northwest Energy now. And, um, but anyway, it's interesting to know that we are addressing that. We also went to the west side of the park this summer and laid out on our porch where we were and gazed. And it was lovely, so black, so many stars. So thank you for your insight, Paul. I loved your book. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Colleen. Um, and I just noticed Joel in the chat mentioned there's a couple great Twitter accounts if anyone is interested in, in uh, 
seeing some auroras. There's aurora underscore alerts is the handle of one Twitter account. And then there's another one at North Light Alert. So those are also in the chat if anyone wants to reference those. Um, let's see, Bonnie was wondering, um, well, she first commented chapter four was really impactful to her. She's wondering, did you expect to veer so far into spirituality when you were looking into light pollution? Um, you know, it's honestly, it's hard to remember um, if I was surprised by that or not. I think that, um, you know, I was, I was telling Doug, asked me, I think before we went on the air uh, that, you know, how did I get into writing the book? And I said, it started with just wanting to learn the stars, you know, wanting to learn the constellations. And then, you know, the minute you start um, doing that, you learn about light pollution. And from there, you know, you're off to the races and all the, all the um, impacts from, from light pollution. And it wasn't too far into the process that uh, um, I started finding books that really did touch on spirituality. And, um, you know, they're, I'm a literature person. There is a lot of literature about the notion of darkness and light. You know, the, as I say in the book, the Bible has plenty of light and dark imagery. Um, uh, lots of just super interesting um, uh, things to think about when it when it comes to that. And I, my own um, history, I was uh, in college, I was a religion major. And so, which is basically, you know, at a liberal arts school is like philosophy of religion kind of thing. But it was something that I was I've always been really interested in, um, uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, the the subtitle of the book um, is something that I I've always really liked. I I came up with it, and I really like it, which is, you know, searching for natural darkness in an age of artificial light. And I I love that it means both, you know, the literal darkness and artificial light, like we've been talking about, but it's also um, a book about I think about the natural darkness that is part of everybody's life, um, that's part of being human, um, and that we live in a, a time um, when we're seemingly obsessed with artificial light in the sense of honoring celebrity and, and not wanting to um, hear about anybody's sadness. And um, I just, I think it's all baloney. I think that it's, uh, you know, every, traditional culture before us has realized that part of the hero's journey is is a is a, an experience of the darkness i mean every hero goes through the dark wood or the um you know the underworld or whatever and darkness has always been a part of who we are and so that's what that chapter is really about and it really um it is if not my favorite chapter one of my favorite chapters in the book i could write i could probably write a whole book about uh, that chapter of the book, because there's so much um, rich literature and tradition and um, and talking about, um, gosh, we're just so afraid of darkness, both the literal darkness and, you know, anything that has to do with sadness or depression or anxiety or that kind of thing. And not, not that it's easy, but um, it is a part of being alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting you just commented on some of that. Um, Steve also had a question. He's a retired psychologist and he was really interested in chapter six about the body sleep and dreams. So um, he's wondering, do you think, is there any advice that psychologists or sleep doctors could use to help people with sleep disorder, excuse me, sleep disorders? Um, in the past, he has advised clients to avoid using any blue light emitting devices uh, 60 minutes before bedtime. Um, is there any other advice you could think of that could really help change people's lives? Yeah, I used to say that, you know, if, if you remember nothing from my talk, just remember that you should sleep in the dark. Like that seemed to be <laughs> kind of one of the overwhelming um, messages that I heard again and again, certainly from sleep researchers, you know, the importance of, um, uh, of sleeping in as the darkest room you can, you can be in. Um, I it was also funny. I was in, uh, I was really lucky. I got invited to New Zealand last year and I met an Australian sleep researcher there and he, he had had, a, a local newspaper. I think he was in Melbourne, and they had done an article about him and his research. And the, I think the headline of the article was something like, uh, 
welcome to the doctor of darkness or something like that, you know? And it was only because when the reporter went to interview him at home, he, he starts turning all his lights down and, and um, you know, a couple hours before in the evening, you know, and just starts to mimic the natural lowering of light. And he said, um, it's crazy that we expose ourselves to all the artificial light that we do and that we stare at our screens until the moment we go to bed. And um, it's just, and again, I heard this from many people, but we're conducting a huge experiment on ourselves and, um, and these people are, these folks are worried about the effects of, of what we're doing. Sure. Okay, everyone, we've got a new moon. Let's all sleep in the dark tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Paul has given us his blessing. Um, Michael had an interesting question um, for people who work at night, um, given, you know, the negative impacts on them. Do you have any, have you come across any suggestions um, in lighting that could help people who may work kind of those night shifts or shifts that are in the nighttime? Yeah, it's a super complex issue. I think I'd be a little hesitant to, to try to offer too much real advice about that. I mean, the, the um, experiences that I had, I mean, I'll never forget um, uh, at the time I was working at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. And I went um, to try to make it through the night with the custodial staff, um, which, you know, uh, at Wake was, um, uh, gosh, 80% um, African-American um, and, and um, uh, folks who had uh, some tough, tough life experiences. And um, I made it until like 1.30 and I was just like, I have to go to bed. And these folks do this night after night, and um, it's really hard on your body. That's what everybody everybody says, and especially the going back. Like some days you're up all night, some days you're not up all night, so you never have a regular rhythm. Seems to be really, really hard on us. Um, you know, some people, I know people who work at night, and, and they. my sister is a pharmacist. She doesn't mind working at night at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, it... it, it at, at some level, I think there's an individuality in it, but um, it really, I think there's a lot more people for whom it's a really difficult um, road to hoe and, and uh, really is taking its toll on their quality of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for touching on that. So I've gotten myself out of trouble already uh, using my other digital device, and we will be carrying Paul's uh, children's book, according to Julia, the director of Park Stores. So, so good question, Carolyn. And so watch for that online here soon. Um, Paul, I'm always curious with great writers like yourselves, what you're reading, what's on your, what's on your, on your bedside table right now, or that that you've read that um, that's really floated your boat. Yeah, boy, what a great question. Um, I'm actually doing a lot of research for uh, a class that I'm teaching next semester, which is looks at, um, uh, it's a class in eco-criticism. If some people know, it's basically looking at literature through an environmental lens. How do we, how do we write about place? How does place influence the way we write? Um, and I'm doing it by, um, looking at, at books from different parts of the world. So there's uh, a, a novel from uh, Australia and some writing from East Africa and a, a book from Norway and that kind of thing. In doing that research, um, some people here will probably know the book, uh, The Tree Where Man Was Born by Peter Matheson, which was published in 1972. And I'd read it a, a while ago. And to reread that and just, you know, what a writer and to, and, and writing about a world that, um, you know, does it even exist anymore? I don't, I don't really know. Um, East Africa in the late sixties, the, the animals that he encounters there. So that was, that was wonderful. Um, I'm reading Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Kimmerer, um, which a lot of people love um, and I'm enjoying that. Um, That's hard to find. <laughs> is it? It is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, Barry Lopez just died um, and his book, um, Horizon, um, which was published uh, maybe a couple years ago, um, 
is breathtaking. And he did uh, Arctic Nights. Is that right? Arctic yeah. Dreams. Yeah. Arctic Dreams. Was, thank uh, you. Yeah. Won the National Book Award in 1986. And Horizon is kind of a it gathers stories from his whole life. And it just if if you're if you love reading and you want to just immerse yourself in a book of just profound, beautiful writing about the, the natural world, um, Horizon is is a good bet. That's awesome. Let's see if we have any more questions. So Paul, Paul did, and I showed this earlier. Um, I blame Paul for my um, insomnia because he mentions a book called Paris, Paris in his book, which is fabulous. And, and I love the section about Paris. And then in Paris, Paris, they mention a set of uh, novels about mystery stories about the Marais. So I had to go get those. So I'm going down this very deep rabbit hole, Paul. <laughs> 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 I was also laughing at Joel's comment. He said, can't tell you how many times I stayed up late reading this book and then fell asleep, woke up in the morning with the lamp on. Oops. <laughs> Turn your lamp off, Joel. Got to sleep in the dark tonight. <laughs> um, okay. I think I'm getting to the end of some of the questions. Tanya um, just brought up the instances of people that had never seen the Milky Way and that woman who had asked what the lights in the sky were, were surprising to her. Um, how often do you hear that? Do you come across that a lot? Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, you know, I think, I don't know where everybody is tonight, you know, what your experiences of the night sky is. I know um, to give people some reference, I, I was really lucky to live in, I grew up in Minnesota, but I lived in New Mexico for eight years and then in Nevada for four years. So I got a real, I have a real love for the West. And um, then uh, I got a job at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. And then I got a job in uh, Virginia. It is not the same on the East Coast. And, um, you know, you don't, you have the clouds for one thing, but you also have a lot more light um, on the East. And so I have students of mine who would come to James Madison, where I was in Virginia, um, in the Shenandoah Valley, and they would they would say, "Oh my God, it's so dark here, and there's so many stars." And I would think, "Wow, you just you can't see the Milky Way." So to give you some reference, there's no Milky Way. They're not talking about that even, you know. Um, and then to see the Milky Way isn't even uh, really that dark, like you know, there's lots more darkness on um, past the Milky Way. So most of my students had just never experienced the kind of night skies that um, a lot of folks who say in the West get to see fairly regularly. Um, they've just, they've grown up in New Jersey and there is no night sky. Yeah. Yeah. Even I grew up in the Midwest in a pretty small town. And even there, I, I feel like once I moved out west, it, it was this whole new concept to me. So yeah, I totally get that. Thanks for touching on that. And I want to, before we run out of time, I want to loop back, Paul, you talked about wanting to kind of touch again about kind of some advocacy kind of policy issues and, and to, to maybe think through that with us a little bit. Um, you know, when you say things like there aren't any more Bortle ones, right? Um, what are people going to be saying 50 years ago? There aren't any more Bortle threes, um, you know. And and so um, you you've obviously talked to a lot of groups and people and, and who are interested. Kind of give us a benefit of kind of your advice of kind of how one might think about advocacy in this area. Yeah, it's a really good question, and it, you know, it, it it it's going to be different wherever you are. Um, depending on where you live, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I love the comment earlier about, um, you know, getting in at the level of, of the building code, for example, that's, that's great. Um, if you're in a, you know, can talk to people on a um, city council and that kind of thing that can be effective. Um, I guess I would, you know, I always, I like to come back to this idea of, uh, this is an issue that we can we can readily deal with. There's lots of reasons to be optimistic ab about it. Lights, for example, are, you know, they're going to fail. They're going to need to be replaced. So at some point, um, every light is going to could be replaced with something better, or just or just turned off. Um, the issue of light pollution. When I talk to guys who, uh, uh, men and women who uh, are active in the in the um, 
with the issue. They say, you know, 20 years ago, people had never heard those two words together, light and pollution. And now it's now it's an issue that a lot of people have heard about. Um, and so we've made that advance at least. And more and more people are, are realizing that um, it's just dumb the way that we light in so many places. There's, there's no reason to have lights that are shining right up into the sky. You know, there's no reason to have um, empty parking lots lit as brightly as they are at during rush hour kind of thing or, or lit at all in some instances. You know, there's just lots of things that we could do. Um, and so that gives me optimism about it. Um, and like with everything that we advocate for, um, a lot of times it comes down to individual people who are willing to um, do the hard work, go to the meetings, write the letters, um, stick with it and that and I've, I've met those people and I really admire them um, so and I think educating too right you mentioned that that, that like in Paris it's a win-win it saves them money a lot of money um, and it it does better for the environment it's safer it's has a, a number of qualities so part of it is I think the car dealership that we all know of in Kalispell thinks it's really safe and worth the money it's cheaper than a security guard education might teach them that it's actually <laughs> better. So it may be one of those rare public policy situations where um, education can create a win-win. Yeah, it's, that's, I, I like to say it's a win-win-win-win-win-win-win <laughs> deal, right? It, it, we, uh, you know, taking care of light pollution helps in so many ways um, that there really isn't a reason why we shouldn't uh, be controlling this this issue, you know. I hear the the park the car dealership thing. It comes up everywhere because everybody has those kind of. And all you need to do is go to Flagstaff or Tucson and go to the the car dealerships there and see the way they light at night, which is not polluting in this way. So there are ways, even for a car dealership, to light for security that doesn't send a ton of light into the sky, right? Um, I think some some organizations like Audubon societies, different kinds of groups um, like that are advocating for dark skies and light pollution issues. So I know I'm in Portland, Oregon, and that they have a you know they they sponsor a turn your lights off at night every once in a while, and they've just brought the issue to all the communities in all the neighborhoods in town. So there's just lots of ways that people are educating other people. That's right. And, and it's interesting. Thank you for the comment. I'm actually writing an article for Audubon on uh, nocturnal nighttime migration. Uh, people don't know that, you know, more than 400 species of birds migrate at night in North America and that our light pollution is a huge unnecessary burden to these to these birds. Um, and uh, the Dark Sky Association has just assigned a letter of, uh, or a, what do they call it, a memo of agreement or understanding with with the Audubon Society. So these, bringing these issues together and really seeing that um, everything is connected, right? And, and that my issue, is, my issue is connected to your issue. My work is connected to your work. Um, that seems uh, like a way we can move forward. Hey, Paul, here's a suggestion for a motto going forward. Black is the new green. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a I feel a sitcom coming up <laughs> starring Randy Gray. Well, uh, Paul Bogard, you've been super generous with your time. Um, and uh, we have the biggest crowd we've ever ever had for a book club. What a great way to start 2021 um, together. Thank you all for a, a super vibrant um, evening. Um, next month, we're going to do Engineering Eden um, by uh, by Jordan Fisher Smith. Um, which is another really very different, uh, but super interesting uh, nonfiction uh, story about uh, great stories of things going on in parks. Um, Will, uh, I see Julie Doherty in park stores. Actually, I was never in trouble apparently because she's on the, she was, she was watching the whole time. So had my back <laughs> as always. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to, uh, um, to having more of these discussions in the future. Paul, thank you. We hope you'll come and visit us in Glacier. You're now part, now part of the Glacier family. That's been my pleasure. Thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. It's been really great to be talking with you.
Great. Thanks, everybody. And uh, have a great evening and, uh, and have a really um, uh, rest restorative 2021. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Paul. Good night. Thanks, Paul. My pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. And thank